on peut commencer parce qu'on va avoir sure un intervenant begin. donc euh, en, en mondial vision euh, à distance because donc, we have one of our guests uh, online démarrer quitte à s'arrêter quelques instants even if we need to, we could start now if we may have to stop for technical reasons at one point tellement bien organisé que je suis sûr que ça sera résolu facilement si on a un petit moment de, de, de latence even if uh, there's a small gap at some point if this final round table un peu de performance mais on a bit of performance comme c'est quand même la troisième de l'après-midi d'élargir the third one of the day we'll try to expand to photography in general près du corps Often with uh, the photography that starts with the body, and then things are trying to open this up to a little bit more international. Two special guests today, who will be Rocio Santa Cruz, who as a gallery owner in Barcelona. I will uh, introduce him later. He will talk about his his stand and his artists, the ones who are closest to our, our theme and photography of the body and then we will spend some time uh, with some of the work on Suzanne Tarasiev, some of her work. Suzanne uh, was not able to uh, join us for uh, health reasons, she couldn't be here today, but as her stand has a solo show here at, at uh, Paris photo for Boris Mikhailov and the theme of the body is so important for him. And as in December in 2023, she's going to have another one of her artists, Eugen Taylor, who also uh, shows the body a great deal, who will be having a solo show here at the Grand Palais Ephemer. Perhaps we can, I thought we could, it's a way that we could uh, uh, tilt our hat to Suzanne and show a few, us a little bit of the work and her artist's work, who's uh, doing to have a, a big show in December. So let's start with this uh, Barthélemy Togo. I'm not sure if we need to, to introduce him, but, but uh, he's on the screen here, you can see him. He's a French artist who's the most well-known internationally. He was born in six, uh, 67 in Cameroon where he created the Benjamin Station. And right now, Barthélemy is, is there. And he's with us through our video conference and represented by the Gallery Le Long, which is at uh, Le Long and Co, which is at Paris Photo this year. So it's a photographer who mostly does, has had many solo shows large solo shows. He's at the Picasso Museum in Barcelona right now, which links us up to our, our um, guest here, Rocio Santa Cruz. In her, in, and he's also been in the Lyon Biennale and in Venice and in many other Biennales. After studying at the Abidjan School of Fine Arts in, the, in Côte d'Ivoire, he was accepted at the Grenoble School of Art, where he continues his artistic training, which he completed at the Dusseldorf Academy of Fine Arts in Germany, one of the best establishments for visual arts in Germany. Any of you have a love of photography? It is an institution that produced a whole generation of uh, big photographers trained by Becher, Ile Becher, a very minimalist photographer, very talented, extremely talented, who followed, who trained the next uh, generation, including Thomas Ruf and an artist as well who became uh, very skilled in other, in other fields. So, Barthélemy is really a multidisciplinary artist. He works in painting, inks, drawing, sculpture, great engraving, photography, video, installations, and performance art. And before we talk, who I thank very much for being with us, despite some uh, the techni technology difficulties of that, we're going to look at some works. I've got a little presentation of his work. We all know, which I find so admirable, uh, his inks, his work with the inks. 
with Marlène Dumas and Louise Bourgeois, they're really the three artists who have the greatest mastery of ink technique, amazing, extraordinary colors. Mais également, Barthélemy, c'est un artiste qui s'est illustré. Barthélemy is, has also. Alors là, des sculptures assez monumentales. It's also a uh, kind of sculpture, monumental sculpture. One of them was underneath the pyramid of the Louvre. At the entrance, entrance of the Louvre, Barthélemy was honored and honored us with his colonne, sculpture, which is a, col a column. Same principle. But he also produces ceramic. Appuyez sur le micro en bas de votre écran. Pour vous donner une Là, je crois que c'est une vue. With a view here. Pour le prix Marcel Duchamp. Won the prix Marcel Duchamp, one of the four, it was in the, one of the four finalists for that prize. And also really incredible for an artist such as Tim, is for him to be present in the public space in this metro station in Paris, station which Barthélemy is appuyez sur sur le micro, s'il vous plaît, qui a sur votre écran. Appuyez sur votre micro. Barthélemy, appuyez sur votre micro. From Cameroon, so integrated in his life of his neighborhood. Barthélemy, appuyez sur votre micro, sur votre téléphone, s'il vous plaît. Barthélemy. It's a really integrated uh, contemporary art in, in the city. There's an installation, very famous, one of his very famous, that was presented at the Biennale of Lyon and maybe in also Venice, sculptures in made of wood evoking human busts and stamps at the same time. So really, this idea of migration, moving, he's really developed his work. Another view of that same installation, different presentation, and this one too, the most famous uh, view, which is a very successful installation. Yes, Barthélemy Togo has also done installations uh, with at Le Long and Co in Paris. An installation made of works, separate works, all different from each other, but that had an extra layer of meaning with the scenography, very elaborate, around this idea of strange fruit. During the period of racial segregation, I'd like to show these images because we can really see the plurality of media that uh, Barthélemy Togou masters and uses. It's really remarkable. So, Strange Fruit, once again, installation in a different space. It's very invested in the scenography of his work, the presentation, so this photography here, much not well known, that he practiced in the past, once again. He was so young, back a very young man there, and the series of Afri African presidents, and performances, a view of performances. Hopefully he will be able to talk to us about that. Hopefully we haven't lost him, his connection. We'll be able to talk with him a little bit. Can we get him connected with the uh, video conference between France and Cameroon? He's back. Can you hear us, Barthélemy? Uh, it would appear that he has not uh, put his more activated his microphone, and and uh, so he and he's not aware of that. No, dis lui non. Ouais, dis lui non. He can hear us, but there is a problem with his microphone for the moment. Can, Barthélemy, can you activate your microphone? It's, it's on silent, it's on mute right now. Can you hear me, Barthélemy? So it's a little risky when we have to uh, 
work from a distance. Things sometimes do go wrong. It's almost a performance right now. <laughs> Barthélemy, can you hear me? Appuyez sur votre micro, Barthélemy. Je vois Barthélemy avec la, la He's got the remote and he's trying to activate the sound. Si vous nous entendez, faites ça. Est-ce que l'on peut à ce compte-là, sinon alors, essayer de résoudre le problème technique de connexion avec Barthélemy et passer à la présentation. Perhaps we can move on to the presentation of Suzanne Tarassiev in the while we try to do. Uh, you can see in the back office everybody going crazy trying to fix the issue. No, because he cut his camera. Voilà. Donc en attendant d'essayer de résoudre les problèmes techniques. In the meantime, Télémy, je vais simplement avoir quelques mots. We can send uh, kind wishes to Susan Tarasiev to say that she's not here today. But she's uh, showing, exhibiting here the, the works of two uh, artists from her gallery, photographers. The B18 stand, Boris Mikhailov, is an artist and a Ukrainian photographer who is. His exhibition is not finished, it's still presented at the Maison Européenne de la Photo. Get, make sure you get it. And he's presenting the solo show at the same time at the Gallery Suzanne Tarretier, at the Rue Pastorelle in Paris, in the Marais, right in the heart of the Marais district. So the work of this Ukrainian artist, of course, is quite something at the moment. We see a lot of photographs showing people. À la Maison européenne de la photo. Uh, these are images from the Maison européenne de la photo. This is the one. This is an image from the, uh, shown at the, at the entrance of the gallery, of uh, Suzanne Tarasiev gallery. So you can on stand B18. Make sure you go and check it out. There's lots of small formats. There are prices in a, a few thousands. And maybe not even uh, thousands, maybe just one thousand. Lots of different formats, original works. One of the biggest uh, photographers of, of our time right now. And then Jürgen Teller, emblematic artist for Suzanne Tarasiev, Tarasiev extremely well known, recognized for his provocative photographs, it really, uh, really changed fashion photography. We're here in the Grand Palais next year. He was really in phase with our themes. That's why I thought it would be great to invite Suzanne Tarefiev. So his photo is always a little bit trashy. You can tell a little provoking, a little provocative. Even came in on a uh, on a, a white horse into the gallery, he could do any, and there's nothing too eccentric for him. Once again, Jürgen Taylor, Taylor, and his friends, des un pays uh, également and his friends, the photography of a iconic, also the photography of celebrities, also photographs of celebrities that he doesn't always show on their best light. Kate Moss, Chris, Kirsten Scott Thomas. Kristen Scott, I'm sorry. Kim Kardashian. Kim Kardashian. With a very provocative aesthetic. Kim Kardashian again, seen by Jürgen Teller. And Suzanne Tarasiev, who I send to my, send my affectionate greetings and wishes. So the last uh, exhibition, where he was uh, staged with his wife, and some of the iconic photos for Suzanne. She will do anything for her artists to please them. This one too, very well known. That was in Vogue, Italy. And Suzanne is in Hydra in Greece, was welcoming refugees. A photographic work, which is really shocking and high impact, and all work by Jürgen Teller. So special thoughts go out to Suzanne Tarasiev, who can't be here today for health reasons, and to her gallery. I hope you will all get a moment to go and check that standout and the work 
we still don't have, unfortunately, we don't have Barthélemy bon. Togo back. Alors on verra. D'accord. So we'll see uh, uh, a bit later. Merci beaucoup, Marguerite. Thank you, Marguerite. Uh, donc de voir si on peut récupérer Barthélemy parce que je considère que c'est un artiste ou la très intéressante. He's a very interesting artist. artist. I hope we can get him back online. De la photographie et de la performance. Dans Both travail, photography and performance. Euh, qu'il était intéressant de discuter avec and lui. Really Et really 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 to to so let's move on Santa to the Cruz. Rocio Santa Cruz euh, and present her. Donc, so, à Barcelone, her work in Barcelona is with her local uh, public and her, public and her and through qui représente des artistes so espagnols, she represents mostly Spanish artists, but some international artists as well. Une trentaine d'artistes, about 30 artists. Jean Denon, Jean Denon Jean Miguel Rio Branco, voilà, Miguel Rio Branco, de l'art contemporain, ou Calilé. La photographie constitue le médium de Calilé. De nombreux de tes artistes. So there's a lot of uh, installation. There's a lot of really there's a, a strong uh, DNA of photography in this gallery. B03 is the stand. Rocio, could you tell us first about how many artists in your gallery of photographers? The third half? About half of, of the gallery's artists are photographers or contemporary artists working with photography as a medium. I'm interested in, in, in contemporary art. The contemporaneity is something, contemporaneous that interests me. And a lot of contemporary artists use photography, even if they're not photographers, really. It's used a lot. Is that a decision that you made? Oh, there's a lot of... It's 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 a lot of... Is, do you make the decision from the opening of the gallery or something that kind of came into being little by little to have half of your artists be photographers? It's mostly uh, when we, I started working here at, at Paris Photo and taking part here. This fair really uh, changed the course of my uh, gallery and as, as a publisher. As a publisher working on supports and books. I was interested in the relationship between the artists, contemporary artists and books. But as I worked with my gallery and with galleries in Paris, I was also looking for markets. And it's often in, in, in fairs, and, and Paris photo is very interesting. I found very interesting as, in terms of fairs. And my first uh, Paris photo, I presented the work of us from the 70s in performance from the 70s, not really photographers. And then gradually, as I had more experience at the fair, I started working with photographers. That side, as a, as a publisher, I, uh, my training as an editor uh, gave me a special view of photography. It's something very close in, in, in publishing and photo. There's a strong relationship. And since 2001, I've been working on a photo photographic archive of Julio Cortata. And I, a little bit by chance, I came on a photography oh. and an experimental cinema. And I was fortunate to work on the. And I was fortunate to be able to work on this. And I was working at the Maison de l'Amérique Latine. I was working with several countries, and I started. I began being interested in the in, in archival work and in archives. But then I traveled to Brazil and went to São Paulo, and I saw at a gallery Marcelo and his exhibition, and I found it wonderful. 
So that brought me to Palipoto. Someone came to see me in my booth, and this is really how it happened. So he brought, you know, a portfolio under his arm, and he said, "My, I, I'm Marcel Giraud's uh, nephew. And I said, oh, I just saw a wonderful exhibition um, in Brazil. And he said, yes, but my uncle was born in Barcelona, and all of his archives are here. I've shown them to me, you know, shown all his work to museums, and he showed me some, some beautiful prints. Uh, and some of those are in my booth. And he said, you know, uh, would you like to look at the archives? So I started studying the archives. I went often to Brazil to do so. Um, a lot of his work was in the museum in Sao Paulo. And I discovered that his wife, she also passed uh, many years ago. And I thought that his wife didn't take photos or no, he took photos. She was a photographer as well. She wasn't just his muse, um, so I did some research, and they did a, you know, a large uh, exhibition on the Potosini Club, which was uh, experimental photography in the 40s, and that brought me to work uh, with these archives, and that's why I wanted to show you a few images. This was another discovery. So, Grosso, so the idea, so your gallery is uh, identified with photography, so historical photography, the 40s, the 60s, the 70s, more than uh, with contemporary photography. No, I'm very interested in archives, but I always try to uh, create that link with our contemporary world and contemporary photography. So I have historical photos. But no, I am an, a, 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 a contemporary art gallery. So I have images uh, from the ages that are in dialogue with uh, work from younger artists, you know, images from 2019. So that's what really interests me, to create a dialogue between archival images and contemporary images. And sometimes it, in the gallery or contemporary art fairs, I, I like seeing that. Um, also creating a dialogue with um, um, artists that work with other media. So I have artists that were trained in Germany in the 30s. Uh, we have Central Europe, uh, Germany, you know, this was really a transverse of uh, relationships. So in 1936, he was in Barcelona after the Civil War. He saw all of these things uh, uh, that were taking place, so people were out, you know, uh, against uh, dictatorships, against coup d'etat. We're out demonstrating. So he said, no, I'm a specialist, of, I'm specialized in performance, but I can, I think that he has quite a, a vision uh, uh, and embraces the body in, a, in such a way that it, it, it can be performative. Uh, we have people here with uh, waving flags, but who are looking at the camera. So, um, no, he has quite the, the a photographer's gaze. So here are people here with their. Well, no, you know, this really shows. Uh, are they really playing to the camera? That's the question. I found that very interesting. Here is another image. There are women. It's, it's very moving uh, when we know what happened. After the 39 in Spain, we see how women, you know, 
are involved and who are, you know, who join the Republican Army. You know, they're marching with their children in their arms or they're marching next to the men, you know, wearing wearing heels. So I find these images, these, these images very moving. And I find that, you know, a sort of performance as well. I find, I found, I found these images, uh, I find it interesting to show these images. Um, you know, he had photographed the dead. He didn't tell his parent, uh, his family, excuse me, before his death, he didn't tell his family that he had hidden thousands of photos in, in, uh, in the garage. I believe he didn't want to show them above all. Because, well, obviously, under Franco, you know, we people were recognized in the images and, and they were brought in by the members of that government. So he took those images and hid them in the garage. And the family found, after his death, all of these images. It's, it's a true treasure. You know, if we think of, you can recognize something of Robert Kappa, for example, in these images. You know, such a wonderful photographer and artist. So a lot of work with shadow. Shadow features heavily in these images. There are some photos from before uh, the Civil War. He was very impacted by this war. Uh, and someone who did not have the right to be a journalist, to take photos. So he never talked about all this work that he had, had made. So now, you know, photos were published in international newspapers in France and Germany. Very interesting. This keeps another use of shadow and you see the man, the car, the corner, the street corner. It's all very interesting. These are images that were taken a few years later. Shadow play again. Could you also show us some work of uh, female photographs, photographers, women photographers? As sometimes women have trouble uh, being included um, in this sphere, and you have included a lot of women photographers. Uh, from uh, 60s, from the 50s. So I'll just show you quickly this work. I'm always interested in history, but like I said, uh, when linked to in conjunction with the present. So these are not involved with Franco or the transition of government, but this, these were taken when uh, Franco uh, was no longer an important uh, a figure and he was no longer present. So she took pictures of people and she called this series Flowers for Franco, who took figures, uh, to, took flowers to Franco's uh, grave. So this is a very interesting book. So I'm also interested in that. Um, photographers who uh, use book format uh, to exhibit their work. So this is, uh, this book was published in 2019. This was uh, um, lauded as one of the top 30 photo books when it appeared. And this references the title of this ex ex exhibit, uh, references a title of a song by Leonard Cohen. So, this is a photographer who, like John Berger, who talks about photography, the subjects, cameras. Tony Campagnan. So these images, this is these are uh, images of nature. The beautiful. And this is the woman that you were talking about, Colita. Uh, a woman photographer. No, it's it's so interesting. You know, by visiting uh, these images, we we learn about 
artists, female artists, uh, when it was so difficult for them to, to be known during their era. So this woman, Colita, is not known at all uh, in France, but this is, she's from the school of Barcelona, Catarroca, Joan Colom, and others. And Colita, she was a contemporary of those uh, photographers, no, they said, oh, yeah, she, she wasn't well known. She said, oh, she's nice. She's sure she wasn't put uh, at the same level of those other photographers. But that's changing. And we see her work uh, exhibited more widely. So this is a woman who is, it, her gaze is a, it's a female gaze looking at women. So it's, 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 a, it's a triangle. It's a woman looking at women, women, and showing the male gaze. Uh, men looking at women. So these were taken at the Barrio Chino, for example. She also took humorous uh, photos. There's always this little. Uh, touch a uh, uh, the humoristic uh, touch. These are posters uh, for cinema, and this is these are from the end of the seventies. So this is after uh, the era of Franco, and. Uh, and we still see this uh, macho uh, view of women. This is a, a neighborhood in Barcelona. We see the male gaze. We see the men uh, in the street observing women. So in, in the Centre Pompidou, there's a photographer. Uh, they have a, a quite a great collection of Jean Colomb uh, images. And there's almost the same identical uh, image, but we don't see the men in those images. We see the women. Here's another image. The, the prostitutes. I love this photo because you see this, this male uh, gaze. We see this man in the background. This is this woman's a prostitute. She was a woman. Here, here are a few less images. This is the mosque in Cordoba, which is just incredible. This is a beautiful photo, an incredible photo. There's everything. Everything is in this photo. And so this book in 1978 was sent, uh, called Antifemina which was censored. And now it was re-edited. It's been re-edited with these very with a feminist, uh, through a feminist lens, really. It's a feminist gaze. A woman photographer in Spain uh, with, a, with a feminist uh, Gaze. So let me talk about Ukalele very briefly. Ukalele, she was a performance artist. Colita, we don't really, we, we never really saw her in her own photos. But Ukalele, yes. These are self portraits. Really? And she's an artist who. Uh, is very well known and uh, in the Movida of, the, uh, of, uh, of Madrid in the 80s, and she recently passed away a few months ago. So these are other self-portraits. She started working and making images young. She was friends with Miguel Barceló. Uh, they all lived in Barcelona. They all knew each other. And she also liked to paint and to draw. And she was always with these groups of men, male painters. And her name was Barbara. So they'd always say, oh, Barbara, just take photos. You take photos of us. Take photos of our Take photos of our paintings. Don't don't paint. Just take photos of us. And uh, she she continued with uh, photography and drawing. But uh, I believe she's an uh, 
voilà, truly la, la uh, a complete a artist. Portrait. Here's another self-portrait. Eh? No, there was no Photoshop uh, back in the day, so everything uh, uh, in that photo was as it was. This was, you know, a spontaneous photo. The liquid, you know, exiting the glass, that's, that's how the photo was taken. She worked uh, in the world of fashion and cinema. Uh, worked with Rosy de Palma, great actress. We see her with different types of scenography. I think that her work with color is very modern, very contemporary. I think that she discovered trends that were actually uh, trendy 20 years after the fact. Yes, I think that in the 80s, she, photos were developed in black and white and then were painted with uh, watercolor. And those are the originals. So then she took uh, also, uh, she also printed uh, Chrome, I believe. This is a. This was the poster for the Arl Festival, and it's just uh, she. She made that it's a series of. Uh, of, of hairstyles, and she didn't only just uh, take uh, self-portraits, she obviously uh, took portraits of her friends, that's her concierge, her, her door woman. Uh, we also see Madrid in the background often, so she's, she, take, she took photos on her terrace often, balcony. This is an iconic image. Another image. That's the same that we just saw. So all of these artists, their images are uh, in your booth. So what what kind of uh, price range for these images? for artists like uh, those that you've talked about with different types of work. So I work with, uh, it is, uh, with original print, but we also have reprints. I like that because you know, photos for me, uh, photography is very democratic so that we can find an original image of Polita for 3,000 euros uh, signed and developed in the, the 80s. But I can also uh, offer uh, a new print for 800 euros. Galele is maybe a little bit more expensive, but prints are a newer print for 1,500 euros. And that's very interesting because I don't know if those of you in the audience, I don't know if you were here when Orlan uh, spoke with us earlier and Orlan said that you know the vintage, uh, older, uh, prints have, have a different quality uh, because sometimes reprints are, are even closer to the intentions that the artist had at the time that that image was made. So, uh, for example, at the time she wanted to print certain things in, in large format, but it was prohibitive. The cost, it, the cost was too high to do that. So that obviously vintage and older originals obviously has its place. Um, but uh, modern prints are more accessible, perhaps, from a financial point of view. For example, some artists they don't want to give me their vintage and their older prints. No, I don't want to show them to you. Uh, I didn't like those photos. The paper they were small. I didn't have enough money to print them in large format. So I want to do some new, some new prints, and we can and we can sell them. He's so happy. Large format meter. 
funny. That's what I wanted, and that's exactly what Orlan said this morning, this afternoon, excuse me. Because there are people who are true photography lovers, and, 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 and we often idealize vintage, the older prints, but we don't take into account the intention of the, the photographer. Uh, they, they, were, they, they, they were obliged uh, to print smaller due to financial constraints or other constraints. Um, so a modern reprint is not necessarily a bad thing. But isn't it great also to hold those originals, you know, the artist's print uh, in one's hands? I wanted to ask you another question. Because you are a gallery located in Barcelona, there's not a real museum in Barcelona, but there's Mafre Foundation, daughter to photography. And because it opened uh, uh, at the seaside, almost on the beach, is that uh, important for collectioners? in Barcelona, collectors of uh, photography. Yes, well, there's a long tradition of photography in Barcelona in the 1980s, it's the Catalans who really created a larger center for photography, which then, you know, was taken over by Madrid for Foto España. Oh. We often talk more about photo and that's very important, but selling photographs in, in, in Spain is still a little complicated. The collectors of, of photos uniquely is, is fairly, uncommon, fairly uncommon in Spain. People do appreciate vintage prints, but I like Paris Photo for that because it's been resisting 25 for, for years. I've been here for, participating for years, and I see how things are evolving. And now you have collectors who really trust your gaze and come and see you every year and say, what do you have this year? What do you recommend? And that's wonderful too, because the gallery is a certain gaze, the gallerist gaze. It's it's really bad that we're talking about Suzanne uh, Tarasiev. It's such a shame that she wasn't able to be here today, because she. I love her her gallery in, in Paris, and it's her gaze. What we're going to see? What's going to? What is Susanna going to show us? What is she? So really, get to that point is is, is that you're really doing good work, and people can trust you that way. Thank you so much, Rocío Santa Cruz. I um, encourage everybody to go visit your stand at E. 43, that's one final attempt to see uh, Barthélemy Togwo, or, or whether we have to uh, give up. Here he is. He can hear us. I'm here. Ah, Barthélemy. Can you hear us, Barthélemy? Good evening. Barthélemy is in Banjoun. In the in the venue, in the, the 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 space that he created in Cameroon. He can hear us. I'm so pleased to have Barthélemy online. We're just going to ask, spend five or ten minutes together because the sound might be a bit tricky. Could you tell us? Uh, in the presentation of your work, I reminded people that you were trained in the Ivory Coast, in France, and then Germany. What place did the teach learning of photography have in that? Because you major majoritarily, majoritarily become a painter, but what was the role in the, in the, of, of your photography training? What place did it play in France, uh, Grenoble, in Grenoble, and uh, Dusseldorf? So this long training you received in the medium of photography in those three countries. In Côte d'Ivoire, I had a very academic training based on sculpture and painting. 
for four years. And when I continued my studies in France, and I went to the Grenoble Art School, final school with Jean de Boulay, Jean de Jumout, as teachers, and I discovered the, the power of photography and, the, and performance. And then I started working that way. I did the series Another Life, where I put myself in tree trunks in Grenoble. And I created a series of photographs. And I took back in Cameroon against the uh, wild exploitation of forests and the destruction of trees and so forth. So in Dusseldorf, when I went to finish my study, then I consolidated everything I learned in Grenoble and I could put that into exhibitions in a very professional way. I was very enriched of what I discovered in Grenoble, mostly on photography, but also about the internet and Photoshop, how we could transform, transform our photos and give different interpretations of the same photos. So I learned a lot more in Grenoble about that. <coughs> which is really a, an avant-gardist school for contemporary art in France. So from Grenoble to Dusseldorf, did you go to Dusseldorf to do more training in photography or was that a secondary consideration? It, no, it wasn't to become a better photographer. It was more to work alongside great artists, see how they worked, or they would, what they would say to their students. So that's why I would go around different, different workshops. Yannif Cornelis, and all of those thinkers really brought me a lot, a whole different dimension to my work. It wasn't really with the goal of, of improving as a, as a photographer, even though there are so many great uh, photo photographers from that school and other artists too, who worked in that media. It wasn't my 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 main goal to become a brilliant photographer i really want to seize the professionalism of those artists those contemporary artists exhibiting around the world and i wanted to really immerse myself in that to consolidate my 10 years of training in other schools in, in Abidjan and, uh, and Grenoble and Dusseldorf. So for several years, photography and performance are less present in your work. Is that, is that, a, is that a, just an impression? Less present, right? You're saying. Could you repeat? For several years now, photography has been less present in your work than it used to be when you were very young. And that all seems to be the case of performance as well. That's true. I was more inspired recently by other media and photography went, is a bit uh, lagging in that way compared to my beginnings. When I started uh, photography in 93, I was I started with an Ultra V, Another Life series. A, a, a series called Transit within air, airports. 
the places where people uh, pass through with travelers with their passports and the serious transit continued into 2019 and this, this series stupid african presidents with staging of performances at the same time i staged them because i was trying to play the role of a stupid african president and i documented that work with photography and then sculpture and painting took the upper hand after that but new good ideas will come to bring me back to photography i i, I hope or i assume there's at one moment in time I had very good ideas and I understood that photography was the medium that was the best suited to expressing them and that's when I used photography but over the decades painting and sculpture and installation installations too yes and installations took more place and photography was a little bit uh, slowed down, but I haven't uh, dropped it, per se. I'm preparing a performance at the Picasso Museum in February for the end of my exhibition. And I will, I will every time I come back to media and techniques, that I had to learn during my training in photography, I won't, I won't be dropping it. So you're confirming that if we come and see you in February in Barcelona at the Picasso Museum, we will see you do a performance. Yes, exactly. Which will be will be will be uh, done really before the perform for the, the, the audience at the museum thank you so much Barthélemy. thank you so much for uh, struggling through the technical issues and allowing us to contact you for today in cameroon see you again soon i hope thank you to everyone Thank you to Rocio Santa Cruz for taking part. Thank you, Paris Photo. And thank you, everyone, for your for being here. Good evening.